what are you looking at these days? What are you liking? What are you hating? Well, it's, uh, there's a lot going on, obviously. And, uh, you know, looking at the space, uh, Q4, last time we talked, uh, maybe a little after that, there's a lot of the multi-state operators coming to market, and, and there's been a few earnings since then. I, I saw in the, in the preamble there we have uh, Acreage, that's going to be reporting, I think MedMen as well, uh, towards the end of, end of this month. So obviously keeping an eye on that. Last week was very busy, though. We had uh, the two leaders in the Canadian space, being Canopy and Aurora, uh, report their first full quarters of recreational contribution. Uh, right. So that's something I've been digesting and taking a lot of uh, investor calls uh, on, just trying to, trying to glean if it's within expectation, uh, you know, given all the different variables in there. And I think I think the key takeaways I I, I, uh, I think gleaned from the information is the pricing is a lot higher than I thought it would be. Now mm. I wouldn't get too excited on that because if you look at all the expansion plans in the industry, uh, there's a potential glut of actually biomass or, or, or cannabis flower that's going to be coming online uh, throughout 2019 and into 2020. So I expect the, the wholesale pricing of the flower to come down. But certainly in, in, in the first three months here, the, the canopies and auroras out of the gate got much higher pricing. Uh, we're still waiting now on the uh, the profitability to finally make uh, make an appearance into the sector, which I do think is, is something quarters away. Yeah, um, you know, on that issue of oversupply and when it's going to happen, not, it's not really a question of if, it's just a matter of when. There's one of the things that I noticed. So cannabis became legal on October 17th. People couldn't really buy clones or seeds to grow at home. So there hasn't really been that uptake in the opportunity to grow at home. Now, mm -hmm. Me being me, I ordered a top-of-the-line four-pod hydroponic system, which I just transplanted seedlings that I started back in January into on the weekend. And, you know, having four plants growing in your house, you sort of look at this and think, okay, if I get 400 grams of plant, uh, you know, I've got, I've got basically a lifetime supply of cannabis for somebody like me. I don't smoke it that much. Um, so I'm just curious. Have you taken that into consideration in your modeling of future revenues that there might be a big sort of glut of demand that is not present in the marketplace because people are taking advantage of the ability to grow their own? I think it's included in my model as much as someone that covers Constellation brands probably considers homebrew in their model. So I would say it's <laughs> Very low, but in, in joking aside, not at all. I do think that it is going to, you know, cut into the market at some immaterial amount. Um, right now, when you look at particularly what's going on in the U.S. and and, and you look at what a mature market looks like, uh, if you're a casual user, uh, someone that might smoke on the weekends or vape or use an edible, it's not a very expensive habit r relative to alcohol. I mean, you can buy a gram of uh, marijuana if you're not a heavy user. That could, you know, be enough for you and your friends for the weekend. You could buy for seven or eight dollars. Right. So it's not something that I think is going to make people have to go and. and and, you know, hopefully it's a labor of love on your part. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it is something that uh, I think people are going to do. But I think it's more of a hobby as to anything. I don't think it's going to be with respect to trying to get cheaper marijuana. Certainly, you're not going to get high potency products. You're not going to get all the different cannabinoid profiles you're going to get. You're not really going to make home edibles, although I suppose you could, which would be a whole other step. Uh, so I'm not really worried about it. I don't really think much about it. I think it's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it really play, comes into play when you're looking at the macro picture. Sure. Okay. And what was what is your takeaway on the or on the reported earnings of Aurora and Canopy in that last segment. Yeah, so I think there's there's sort of uh, three three keys that I would look at. So one we talked about was pricing. The second one would be the actual market share. So it was very surprising the government of Canada actually has released uh, monthly numbers for the first three months uh, mm -hmm. of Canadian rec sales, both between uh, dried bud and 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 uh, oil products. And when you take the the quantities that were sold, I believe it was about 30,000 kilograms if you include what was in inventory at year end, as well as 30,000 liters of oil. And if you try and back into what Canopy and Aurora reported for their sales for the quarter, it seems like those two companies combined had about a 50% combined market share, which is, I think, a bit of a red flag when you're looking at the industry as a whole, considering how many cannabis players there are. Now that's great for Canopy, great for Aurora. I think when you include Afria and Tilray and maybe CanTrust, I mean those companies will probably make up at least to start, you know, 80% of the market, which leaves a very small portion for the other 20 or 30 and you know, you know better than, than anyone out there how many cannabis names are actually out there certainly listed uh, on all the different exchanges. So I think it's a bit of a red flag for investors that might have investments in a breadth of, you know, 20 or 30 of these Canadian LPs. Uh, because I think it's becoming apparent that it's only going to take a handful of these guys to get the market over the goal line, and that's who the Constellations and Altrias and everyone are going to invest in. Uh, and I think that having those two companies come out so strongly is, is an indicator of that. 
Um, so yeah, all in all, I thought it was uh, you know pretty impressive earnings. The the third point being um, profitability. So we had negative EBITDA in the amounts of about negative 75 for for Canopy and negative 40 or so uh, for Aurora. So still a long ways away. Canopy obviously has you know four billion plus sitting on its balance sheets with warrants to bring in another four billion. So I don't think they're too worried about the burn. But at some point, investors are going to want to see an inflection into positive EBITDA so that uh, a reasonable assumption could be made as to what uh, EBITDA multiple should be applied. Right now, as you know, with the valuations, it's very hard to decipher how investors look at it. Yeah, you bet. Um, so in terms of the volume of sales in the first full quarter of legal cannabis in Canada recreationally, do you think that's a number that's going to grow over time? Or do you think that's pretty much the volume we can expect to see in terms of consumption by Canadians going forward? Yeah, so I don't, you know, obviously it's going to be higher. I don't have the, you know, the, the crystal ball as to what the number would be, but my back of the envelope calculation that I think I put in a note the other day is that I think the ultimate demand is about 10 times higher than what was sold. Now, again, it's a, it's a relatively low base. I think there was probably between recreational medical about 250 to 300 uh, million of revenue sold in the quarter, which is great for a start, but really you have to look at where the bottlenecks are in this space. And there's a little bit when it comes to what the producers are producing, but the biggest bottleneck by far in the state has nothing to do with the producers it's the government and retail infrastructure and being able to put cannabis in the hands of consumers so right now it's predominantly an online model even in states or provinces rather that have uh, private sector that has been in uh, working on this for some time there's not many stores opened I, I took a, a, a glance into the one in uh, one of them in uh, Vancouver a couple weeks ago and it's basically empty compared to all the other illegal ones running around and that's because <laughs> The second point being you don't have product breadth, so you don't have infrastructure to get these into the hands of the consumers, and then you're not providing what a recreational user is going to demand. So if you go to California or some of these other states, we don't have edibles in Canada, we don't have vape pens, we don't have all these product classifications that really uh, lift the market up. So your incremental user, someone that doesn't smoke cannabis, someone that doesn't think about cannabis, if you ask them today, are you a cannabis user, they're not going to have the ability to even potentially participate into this market until it looks a little more CPG friendly, it's in stores, it's beside you know shoppers or in shoppers it's beside where they go grocery shopping uh, it, you know you're not going to really get it from in my view overpriced cannabis just on an online platform sure do you think that the government of Canada is going to get that point that they're kind of keeping the market down by being so restrictive and so conservative with the rules I mean even alcohol manufacturers have a lot more liberal uh, policy towards them in terms of how they can advertise, what kind of events they can sponsor. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's just a matter of time till the government of Canada eases up and says, okay, this isn't going to turn into the reefer madness show we thought it was. We can pull back on some of these rules and let these companies make a yeah, little more they, money. I'm certain they're aware of it. I don't think there's a lot of incentive to to walk before or to run before you can walk rather uh, we'd all like to see that certainly the LPs would like to see it but coming into an election year the last thing you want is having every color gummy bear and gummy worm out in the market and then some miner gets their hands on it and you have a PR nightmare so um, I, that's just one small factor but I mm -hmm. think the real you know reason why we are here today in terms of being a little behind the eight ball with 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 the rollout is just a function of when you go back in time and it was all medical and my understanding at, at you know at least when I started looking at this market uh, in early 2016 there might have been 30 people at Health Canada working in this cannabis group and they've slowly been growing and growing and growing so there just hasn't been the resources uh, there in order to facilitate a fast-growing market uh, where I think there's been pretty big missteps that could have been avoided is on the retail rollout I have no idea why uh, obviously Ontario had a, had a provincial election and the leadership changed and okay the model got pivoted but out in Alberta why is there you know whatever the number is now 10 stores and, and BC five stores you know two years after this was sort of known known to be in the mix so that that's a little bit surprising um, so you know there's incentivized there's incentive for the government to roll this market out given all the tax money that's at stake um, but I you know given that's the government I don't think you know don't expect this to happen in the next couple of quarters yeah do you think the private model is better than the government model in states or in rather provinces where it's more privatized like Alberta as opposed to where it's more restrictive like Quebec. Well, I think, you know, if I could design it from the ground up, yeah, I think that, you know, when you put the private private sector into it, it'll probably be done a little more efficiently because, you know, they need a return on their investment uh, for putting it for putting it into the different retail locations. Um, I, you know, personally don't hate the LCPO. I think it's a pretty run store, but that's, you know, decades in the making. So in terms of 
rolling out this market. I think a private sector is probably a, a, a better model. But more so, I think you should be you should be leveraging off of people in uh, parallel industries like traditional retail or even the LPs themselves and helping to do that. With what Ontario did by putting this in a lottery where the criteria was you have to have a credit card and access to internet. I mean, it's a little silly. I mean, no disrespect to any of the 25 people that got it, but it doesn't make sense to me that that's how you would roll the market out. So that I, I don't really understand either. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a situation now where we've, let's say we have a mature cannabis market in terms of the large cap cannabis companies in Canada. We've still got a, a never-ending bouquet and, and, and sort of rain of small companies that are coming to market and there's the range of business models is growing wider, um, but there's, a, there's been a few real significant ones emerge, like the biosynthetics. I've now got seven PowerPoints on my desk from seven different biosynthetic companies. Obviously, biosynthesized cannabis is a threat to the large producers in some respects, because if it can be produced at a much lower cost of input, then obviously there, there's a risk there. Uh, do you think which of these sectors do you still like at this point in halfway through Q1 of uh, or I guess yeah almost exactly halfway through yeah. Q1 at this point which of these other sectors like large caps small caps coming to market multi-state operators in the U.S. biosynthetics uh, we just had Raj Grower here from High Tide which is specializes yeah. in equipment and paraphernalia which of these sectors do you get most excited about? Well, there's a lot of them. So the one that I like the most, although it doesn't, it's not on the Canadian theme, is the multi-state operator. When you add up the, and I think we've, we've talked about this before, the market capitalization in Canada is 100 billion or whatever it is this hour. Uh, if you cut that in half or, in, or, or by 60 or 70 percent and say, this is how much I think the Canadian sector is overvalued, assuming you think that, that's still well higher than the m macro market cap of all these multi-state operators, where I think the combined uh, value is about 15 billion right now. So these are companies that have access to hundreds of millions of potential customers are vertically integrated where they're not dealing with the government at all for their retail stores and there's less of them to digest. I mean there's probably going to be an increasing profile but there's sort of six or seven that are really out of the gate as the leaders so that's uh, what I'm looking at. In the, in the Canadian space, I think, you know, the biosynthetics is obviously something that's interesting. I actually don't have the view that it would necessarily be a, a competitor with, uh, with the large caps uh, should it go that direction because at the end of the day, excuse me, <clears throat> at the end of the day, what's going to happen here is the market is going to transition to CPG. So whoever gets the leading market share right now in Canada, you know, as the quarters turn into years, that's going to turn into a brand. There's going to be brand equity there. And then someone like Bruce Linson at Canopy, and there's been others as well, they're just looking for the lowest cost input or the most efficient cost input. So whether that's growing it yourself in year one, to buying it wholesale in year two, to having some lab concoct it for you in year three, I don't think the, I think the, the runway is too long for those types of companies for them to actually come in and compete with them. So that's not one that I think is necessarily a bad investment opportunity because I think there's a, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, IP and, and R&D that needs to go into this space given how histo the historical illicit nature of it. Um, but it's going to take some time. I don't see a, one of those companies dethroning one of the leaders in, in the LP space. Mm -hmm. Matt Bottomley, great perspective as usual. We're going to have you back sooner rather than later again. Thanks for joining me today.